All right, good afternoon. Howdy, friends and neighbors. It's about time to get started with the weekly services of the Oklahoma Conservative PAC. Hello, John, David. Welcome, everyone. So we always begin with a prayer and a flag salute, but first, please turn off your cell phones. Turn off your cell phones. See, that'll also keep you from recording the secret meetings that we have where we plan conservative strategy. <laughs> Pay no attention to the camera. <laughs> We're not really recording anything. Okay, so if you'd all stand together, Paul Kelly's here. He's going to lead us in the flag salute. But first, we have young Daniel is going to come up and lead us in prayer. Thank the Lord for the food. Come on up, Daniel. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity for us to come over here and speak about what we believe and discuss different political problems. I pray that you'll um, help us to see from a different perspective this world, and I pray that you'll um, help us to uh, get along in our different views. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Do we have any elected officials in the room? I see none. It turns out we are all elected by God as his ambassadors and representatives. And as his ambassadors, we have sovereignty. And we should be standing up for his laws and his righteousness. Amen. A couple of stories, a couple of announcements that I have. Um, I was having lunch in downtown Oklahoma City the other day in just a little mom and pop cafe, and I was walking back to my car, and as I walked up the alleyway, here comes this little Nissan with tinted windows. I didn't know who was in there, so I kind of stepped to the side, and this car comes pulling up right beside me. The window comes down nice and slow, and here's this smiley guy with gold chains on, and uh, he's just grinning at me. And I said, well, hello. And he said, man, I saw you on the YouTube. <laughs> he said, that's pretty good. I said, did you vote no? He said, well, of course I did. <laughs> so you just never know where this stuff is going to go. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Today, down at the Capitol, uh, our legislators who have just been elected by us are swearing their oaths of office in the House and in the Senate. Uh, and so that is happening. Probably the House members are maybe just saying, you know, amen and, and God help us right now. And then the senators will do it this afternoon at 2.30. So I got to thinking about that. According to the Secretary of State, every officer of a state agency, board, commission, court institution and the state legislature before entering upon the duties of office is required to file an oath of office and a loyalty oath with the Secretary of State. It means every one of these officials has a sworn piece of paper that's notarized on file with the Secretary of State. What is it exactly that they're swearing to? Well, let's pretend that I'm, say, Jason Murphy, for example. That way we don't get mad when I read this because we know that he'll keep his oath. He's going to say today, I, Jason Murphy, do solemnly swear that I will support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Oklahoma, and that I will not knowingly receive directly or indirectly any money or other valuable thing for the performance or non-performance of any act or duty pertaining to my office other than the compensation allowed by law and I further swear that I will faithfully discharge my duties that's what they all said today or will say today I see some of you laughing <laughs> if we didn't laugh we'd cry if we didn't cry we'd shout if we didn't do any of that we might take up arms I don't know it's very very frustrating is it not Charlie's going to interrupt my monologue to make a comment come on up here Charlie let me just say every time Congress does that because there's 535 up or 435 in the house uh -huh. that's the largest exercise in perjury that ever occurs in the history of the United States 
the largest exercise in perjury when Congress does that. Yeah. A class action suit waiting to happen, says Porter Davis. That's excellent. You know where I'm headed? Let me tell you a little story. In 1815, 1850, a man by the name of Josh Glover was sold at auction as a slave in St. Louis, Missouri. He was taken to a plantation outside of St. Louis where he worked and lived for a couple of years. And then one night he decided to go for a walk. And he never came back. Traveling at night, using the stars and following the rivers, he made his way over 300 miles north to the free state of Wisconsin, where he settled in a little town called Racine, just 20 miles north of Milwaukee. There, he worked and lived, performing many of the surfaces that he previously did for free, but now as a free man getting paid for his labor. At the time, there was a federal law the Anti-Fugitive Slave Act had been passed, and it was against federal law. It was a criminal act to help a fugitive slave escape. Well, a federal marshal tracked Josh Glover to his little cabin where he kicked down the door, beat him over the head, threw him in a wagon, and took him down to Milwaukee and put him in the county jail because the next day he needed to go show his federal warrant to a local magistrate before hauling him back to St. Louis. Wisconsin, being a free state, didn't like the treatment of their citizen this way. And there was a rebel rouser by the name of Booth who owned a printing press in Milwaukee. He stayed up late printing flyers, then he hopped on his horse like Paul Revere and rode through Milwaukee shouting, A man's liberty is at stake! And he was able to rouse up a couple thousand people to come to the jail that next morning. And somebody says, Look, here's a big, large timber. That ought to do the job. So they broke open the jail and took Josh out, where he escaped on the Underground Railroad to Canada and lived the rest of his life. So obviously Mr. Booth, as the rebel rouser, was prosecuted. And the court system in Wisconsin said that he was not guilty. In fact, it went all the way to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, who found him not guilty, and said that the Federal Fugitive Slave Act was unconstitutional. Nullification. They refused to cooperate with the federal courts. They refused to cooperate with the United States Supreme Court. And it took the United States Supreme Court five years to finally find him guilty after spending $36,000 to defend himself and being found guilty in the United States Supreme Court. He was fined $1,000 and sentenced to 30 days in prison. However, just on the principle of the matter, he refused to pay the fine. So they wouldn't let him out of jail. So he sat there for many long months until finally President Buchanan, President of the United States, remanded his sentence and let him go home. But these are people who took seriously an oath to God, a moral and sacred duty to uphold the law of the land based on God's righteousness, that it is wrong to kill people and steal their stuff, and that slavery is wrong and it is unconstitutional. And today we have the same kind of thing happening when the federal government tells us that we can murder babies. And Mary Fallon is about to get two murder centers for the price of one veto because Planned Parenthood just announced that they're going to reopen a new clinic in War Acres to go along with one that just opened in South Oklahoma City. We have terrible blood on our hands, but especially on the hands of our elected officials who have sworn to uphold our state and federal constitutions. Killing children is a direct violation of that Constitution in multiple ways. The most obvious way being the Fifth Amendment, that you can't take life without due process of law. But of course, civil law, criminal law, was never granted to the federal government. What is and isn't a crime, what does put you in jail and not in jail, is left to the states. That is up to us to decide what the punishment should be for murdering babies, not the federal government. And every elected official, from the bottom to the top, who doesn't do something within his jurisdiction and authority to stop this, is violating his oath of office. From city council members who have a butcher center in their city, to sheriffs and police officers in those jurisdictions, to district attorneys, to the state attorney general, to the governor, to the legislature, to the courts, all of them have some authority to try and stop the murder, and none of them are doing it. It makes me angry. So we will be reminding them of their oath of office beginning now and continuing until they stop the atrocities. The 
Constitution, my friends, can no more bind a government than the Ten Commandments can make people behave themselves. We're not ruled by pieces of paper. We're ruled by principles which we individually choose to obey or disobey, which we uphold or we tear down. Therefore, we, the people of these United States and our elected officials, must hold each other accountable to uphold the law. All right, that's the end of my monologue. What's next? Our speaker today. Announcements or comments before we go ahead and, and hear from our speaker today. Very good. Our speaker today is Byron Schlomach of the 1889 Institute. I've asked him to come and talk about uh, what regulation does to business in Oklahoma. That's one of, his, one of his many areas of expertise. So I'll let him visit, then we'll ask questions, and that'll be our program today. Byron, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm uh, just in the way of introduction. I'm, I'm an economist. Got my training at Texas A&M University. Spent most of my life in Texas. Um, gig em. I know. I know. But I have the ring. And, all right. Gig em. Uh Yeah, I've got, I've got two degrees from Texas A&M. So, um, got my Ph.D. there as well as my undergrad. And uh, spent about eight years out in, Oak, out in Arizona with the Goldwater Institute and then came here, um, where I'm now living closer to my parents than I ever did when I lived in Texas. And they're still in Texas. So uh, anyway, I grew up just across the border south of Wichita Falls. Um, I, uh, I've worked in the area of... Um, public policy now since 1994. I went to work for a state legislator in Texas and um, worked obviously mostly public education ad nauseum. Uh, it got kind of tiring, frankly, but uh, worked at the controller's office in Texas, which is a statewide elected official, and they have practically the equivalent of a little think tank within that office. And then I went to work for the Texas Public Policy Foundation which is a free market think tank, very similar to OCPA, only bigger. And, um, and then went to Goldwater, and now I'm here. And the 1889 Institute is only a couple of years old, and it's pretty much me and a professor at OSU and another young lady <laughs> right now. So we're not, we're not a big operation. The specific topic I'm going to talk about today has to do with occupational licensing. Um, it's something I've written on a couple of times now here and in Arizona. Um, it's a subject that has been kind of near and dear to my heart since I was in graduate school when I first started thinking about it critically as an economist and came to the conclusion that occupational licensing is not just unnecessary, but in my mind, it, it, it's downright evil. And I'll tell you why. And, and what I, I t entitled this little talk was uh, the occupational licensing, a, uh, a uh, special privilege masquerading as public safety. Because every time a new licensing law is passed, the argument is, well, we have to do this because it's the way that we, we have to protect the public. But having worked in government for a legislator, I can tell you I personally have never witnessed advocates for a licensing law who were just regular citizens. It's always the members of the profession who are asking to be licensed. Now that starts sounding like a fox wanting to guard a hen house. And, and that's exactly what, what it is. There was one exception. I remember a state legislator in Texas who got an infection in her finger after going to a, oh, a manicurist. And she passed a bill to more heavily regulate manicurists. That's always the solution. There ought to be a law, right? Um, it's interesting when you look at licensing in the, in the United States, it arose from um, the medical profession. 
And licensing in the United States was kind of common by the end of the 18, uh, 1700s. But in fact, during the 1800s, there was an effort to get rid of licensing for physicians. And part of the reason for that probably was because they had a tendency to cut a vein open and let you bleed. And uh, it just wasn't very effective treatment. People realized, I mean, seriously, why are we licensing people to cut open veins? And so they got rid of licensing for doctors. And in fact, from the historical evidence, there is no evidence that people suffered as a result of getting rid of licensing, nor is there evidence that things demonstrably improved once licensing came back. And by 1910, I believe it was, uh, licensing in the medical profession was widespread in the United States and, and being actively enforced. It's that late in our history, it's only been in the last hundred years that we've had widespread licensing in medicine. And so I strongly question how much benefit it, it really is. And I, and I will tell you, I, I take the extreme view. I, I'm, I'm a complete non-believer in licensing. There are plenty of people who believe that, oh my goodness, we at least need to license doctors and attorneys. Um, I'm, you know, I'm willing to go for uh, a half measure, but but I honestly don't even believe that's necessary. And uh, let me give you a few facts. 38 states right now license geologists, supposedly for public safety. Geologists are not licensed in Oklahoma. They are licensed in Texas. And part of the reason I highlighted this was because I had a hand to play in delaying that for about four years in Texas. I found this little thing called a point of order on their bill. and, and uh, the member I worked for got it killed. By the way, he's one of the few people that I know who've ever been elected to a legislature that didn't profit from the office. Um, that was I didn't always agree with him. He was a lot more moderate than me, but uh, he, I, I can say uh, that he never profited from the office. He, he lost money. Uh, by the way, the pay in Texas is $600 a month, so... Um, which tells you that most of them figure out a way to make it pay, frankly, because there are a lot of incumbents there. Uh, there are no term limits in Texas. Several states license interior designers. Now, I've never really understood the public safety issue involved there. I don't know. Maybe there's an, a, a deal with getting uh, vertigo from, from colors that don't coordinate. I, I'm, I'm really not sure. Oklahoma, though, does have a registration law, which is a mistake. Clearly, the legislators here decided to throw a bone to the interior designers. Okay, we'll create a registration law for you. What's the problem with that? It can be turned into a licensing law fairly easily. Um, Barbers and cosmetologists are licensed in all 50 states. And a lot of people say, well, now, wait a minute. You know, there's head lice. There are other skin diseases that can be passed on. All of that is true, but it's also pretty easy to, to monitor as a customer whether or not a barber or cosmetologist keeps things clean. And so I'm really, you know, not too enamored of that either. Besides which, all of these barbers and cosmetologists, their shops, are open to inspection and are inspected. So if we have to have some sort of regulation, just keep doing that and force them to register so that they're easy to find. What is, the, you know, the, the whole licensing thing? I mean, it takes many more hours to get licensed as a barber or cosmetologist than it does to get an EMT license. That tells you how out of kilter things are. Why is that? Well, it's very simple. These are little cartels that have been created, and they're designed to keep people from entering that profession in as big a numbers as they would otherwise. That keeps prices high. Landscape architects are commonly uh, licensed. In 1950, 5%, only 5% of the workforce was occupationally licensed. Today, it's closer to 29%. Um, 
According to the Institute for Justice, Oklahoma, they ranked Oklahoma, uh, they looked at Oklahoma's licensing regime for modest income professions compared to other states. These are just for modest income professions. They didn't look at nursing practitioners or dental hygienists versus dentists and doctors and all that sort of thing. Those are high income professions. They were looking at things like um, social worker. Believe it or not, social workers are licensed. Um, plumbers, electricians, that sort of thing. Oklahoma licenses 29 of the 102 occupations that they looked at. Oklahoma um, is the 41st most broadly and honorably licensed among the states, which is a good thing. We're, we're way down on that ranking. But given the licensing laws that exist, we're the 11th most burdensome state when it comes to licensing. In other words, we don't license a ton of these professions like a lot of other states do, but when we do, we do it right. Um, we really sock it to them. Um, licensing is a special privilege. It's a, it's a protection. It's very much like the medieval guilds. There's a, a neat quote from Milton Friedman which, where he said that Getting rid of the medieval guilds was indispensable. It was an indispensable early step in the rise of freedom in the, in the Western world. Economic freedom and political freedom are very closely tied. You can look at China and say, well, but they're not politically free. Give it time. Uh, because they're economically free and because they can communicate due to that economic freedom, it's, it's coming. Over time, it's coming, that political freedom, and vice versa. Um, if you give people political freedom, they'll seize the economic freedom if they don't have it already. We are, in a lot of ways, with licensing, doing a retro move, moving toward the past. Now, med medieval guilds mostly used violence and threats to enforce their privilege. But today, under licensing, we use the government. And let's be honest, these licensing agencies are not independent government agencies. They are run by and for the professions that they regulate. If you look at the licensing boards, look at the board for licensing uh, physicians, look at the board for licensing um, dentists or any other of these boards, they're made up of the people who practice that profession. And so you get weird situations, like when I was in Arizona, I noticed that the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, pharmacists regularly changed their pass cutoff on the pharmacy exam. And, and they changed it based on how many passed. I guarantee you that you would find a correlation. The more that scored highly, the higher the score it took to, to pass. The more that scored lower, well, they let the score go down. In other words, they were regulating the numbers that entered their profession and restricting them. Not for the sake of public safety, but for their sake. Um, and by the way, economists have looked at medical professions and other professions and said, okay, well, what is the evidence that public safety is really improved by licensing? And basically the evidence is scant to non-existent. You can look at all the, there are several studies that have looked at nursing uh, uh, licensing. And what they found is that maybe there's sort of, kind of maybe some evidence that it improved safety. Most of the studies found no evidence whatsoever. And an economist who's really the premier economist researching this, a man named by the name of Morris Kleiner from, I believe, uh, Minnesota, looked into this. He, he, there are some professions that are licensed in some states and not in other states. And he looked at the professional liability insurance rates for these professions across states. Now, you would think that if licensing really protects people and it improves quality, 
that it would cost less to insure your profession in a state that's licensed, right? That's not true. The licensing rates don't vary. There's no difference across states in these professional liability licensing rates. So what are the actual impacts of licensing? Well, it's arguable that there are negatives when it comes to quality. My father is a retired physician, um, general practitioner, practiced in the big metropolis of Archer City, Texas. And uh, it has 1,800 people, just so you know. Um, <clears throat> but he was the only doctor in the county for a long time. And, and uh, so he had a pretty good practice. But um, one of the things that you find out is that there are a lot of deaths in hospitals from infections. That people don't, people don't go into the hospital with that infection. They get the infection in the hospital. You know what the major thing is that could be done to reduce the infection rates in hospitals? Doctors wash their hands. Now tell me this. These people have had years of education, residencies, internships, and they can't remember to wash their hands now, I've witnessed my dad, you know, he's treated me a few times, sewed me up a couple times, you know. I even went and scrubbed up one time, watched him do a surgery. Holy cow. He is a, uh, what do you call it? When it comes to cleanliness, he's a Nazi. Uh, he was crazy. I mean, I actually wasn't crazy about it. The fact is that my dad, um, when he did surgeries, he didn't, he didn't prescribe antibiotics after a surgery. And he did not have problems with infections. Yeah, because he kept things clean. <laughs> In fact, I've watched him sew up somebody that split their head open at, a, at the rodeo. I mean, and I watched him dig dirt out of this. And it was pretty trauma-inducing for me. But that was just a day at the office for him. And... and uh, he didn't, he didn't do antibiotics for that. He cleaned up the wound. Um, and that's... My dad started practicing in 1961 independently. Um, this is old knowledge, yet we have all these infection problems. Why is that? Doctors don't tell on each other. They don't do anything to really enforce their licensing laws unless it's absolutely egregious. And even then, it's often the case that doctors, lawyers, nurses, and others cover up for each other. They don't, they don't tell on each other. There's not really any evidence that this licensing helps that much. That's in that area. We could look at other areas. Um, the, uh, the result of licensing is that we all pay higher prices for services that licensed individuals provide for us. And so it's a redistribution from the relatively modest income people to very wealthy people in, in many cases. Not every licensed profession is uh, characterized by people being very wealthy, but look at, but, but by restricting that competition, their incomes are relatively high and we end up paying that price and making their incomes all that much higher. That cost of living is higher. In fact, I, I, I've been looking at this, uh, comparing cost of living across states. And as it turns out, Oklahoma has a very low cost of living. So low that when you rank the states by personal income per capita adjusted for cost of living, we're 10th in the nation. The only northeast state in the top 10 is Connecticut. New York ends up. 41st because of their extraordinarily high cost of living. It's great to have a low cost of living, and we've achieved that by relatively low, having relatively low regulation more than anything else, especially when it comes to land use and housing regulation. But, um, but if we, it turns out that according to one study, we actually license more of the workforce 
than the national average. And if we dropped that, according to my calculations, and, and they're, believe me, it's economic modeling. I know how iffy these calculations can be. But by my calculations, we could lower our cost of living another $800 per capita in this state if we just reduced our licensing numbers to that of the national average. Um, it's reduced opportunity. People have a harder time moving up in the world because of licensing, because of these onerous requirements to get 1,500 hours of training to become a barber for Pete's sake. Really? To cut hair? Um, I cut my own hair. You can probably tell. I do it as rarely as possible, too. But anyway, but that's not why I'm bald. Um, it causes there to be reduced mobility. People are less willing to move across states because oftentimes there aren't these reciprocal agreements where to move to another state, if you're already in this licensed profession and that state licenses it too, you're going to have to take their exam in order to get their license and keep practicing your profession. Um, so consequently, people don't move around as much as they would otherwise, and, and that's not optimal. One of the greatest strengths of the United States of America is that when we were created, if you read the Constitution, look at the powers of Congress in uh, Article 8, right? Or is it Our section? Art section. Article one, section? Section 8. Article 1, Section 8, which sounds terrible because isn't that the section for when you're crazy um, in the Army? But anyway, <laughs> that section, if you read it carefully, what is it doing? All it's doing is giving Congress the power to protect and not violate a free trade zone. That's all it is. The biggest tr free trade zone in the world at the time. And that's why we're so wealthy and so well off and have done so well. Is because that was followed for at least a long time. Um, and, and, and the limitations were followed for a long time. Well, all the more important it is for people to be f freely able to move from one state to another. Now that, you know, foreign immigration is a different thing, but internal migration should be as free as possible. And it's not because of licensing. It reduces innovation. Because people aren't free. You know, why, why are chiropractors licensed? Well, part of it is because doctors harassed them so much that they had to be licensed to stop being harassed. And that's the other effect of licensing, is even more licensing. Um, you know, there are some terrible dangers to society that licensing has prevented, though. Like, um, there's this horse masseuse in Arizona uh, that they went after for practicing veterinary without a license. Um, the same has happened in multiple states for people who file the teeth of horses. How dare you do that? There's an important public safety issue for people who go and file horses' teeth. Um, same way with horseshoeing, same has happened with horseshoeing. In some states, horseshoeing, being a farrier, is licensed. Um, oh, and hair braiding. I'm telling you what, those hair braiders are so dangerous. Now, in a lot of states, <laughs> cosmetology is licensed, but they don't explicitly have the right to regulate hair braiding. And so when they've tried to regulate hair braiding, Outfits like the Institute for Justice have gone and filed suit against those states, uh, against those agencies for doing that. Well, they wouldn't prevail in Oklahoma. No, this is one of those examples of where we got it right. We license hair braiding in the state of Oklahoma. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you feel safe knowing that now? Probably, actually. This is, a, this is a bipartisan offending kind of thing. In fact, I, I, okay, I'm not going to use a name so I can't get in a lot of trouble, but, but he's also not in the legislature in Texas anymore. But there was this one fella that who became the chair of the licensing committee in Texas. 
And he carried every one of these licensing bills. And I swear I was in a room one time with him and another legislator that I didn't like, both of them Republicans. And I swear I could feel my IQ dropping. It was, it was like they had an IQ black hole between the two of them. And uh, it was kind of scary, you know? But anyway, sorry, that's an aside. That really doesn't have anything to do with licensing. But, um, charitable doctors. There's this fellow that used to work with Wild Kingdom. He was the, tr you know, the guy that actually they filmed working with the animals and all. I forget his name, but he formed a charity in Tennessee to go around the earth, basically, get doctors to volunteer and do free health clinics. He'd like to do that in the United States, but he can only do that in a couple of states because, holy cow, we can't have a doctor from Pennsylvania doing his stuff in Arizona. Why? Why, he might do something that's not in the scope of practice under the law in Arizona. And we can't have that. There's no telling what kind of dangerous people they let be doctors in Pennsylvania or Tennessee or someplace like that. The, the, the world is crazy outside Arizona. Um, well, that's true for Oklahoma too. Um, oh, by the way, according to the law, how many of you have ever, okay, well, I, I don't know, probably shouldn't raise your hand because you'd be confessing to a crime. How many of you have ever installed like a new outlet in your house? You know, cut the hole. You're a criminal. You're, you're a criminal. Under the law in the state of Oklahoma, you're not supposed to do that. Only a licensed electrician is supposed to do that. We cannot figure out quite how to hook black to brass and white to silver and bare to green. That's hard. We got to have a licensed individual do that for us. Um, midwives. Midwives, when they started licensing physicians that made mid midwifery illegal, when that happened, guess what happened to the mortality rate among women at giving birth? Well, no, it had to have gone down, right? Because doctors are, they're the experts. They're the ones that know. That's, this is for public safety. No, of course, you're right. Mid once they made midwifery illegal, because a lot of people couldn't afford the doctors, and there weren't that many of them anyway, the mortality rate among women giving birth went up, not down. Isn't that wonderful? It's for our own good, though. Now, there are a lot of things we could do to fix this. And frankly, I think the first thing we should do, the most, probably the mildest thing we could do, is to just um, reconstitute the boards. Put more people, in fact, I would make it a majority of people who don't practice that profession would be on the board, a majority. And the people who do practice the profession would be a minority if you let them on the board at all. Um, they ought to be members only on an advisory capacity, in my opinion. It's too extreme for a lot of people, especially legislators. But anyway, um, and I can say that because none of them are here right now. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. But anyway, um, another thing that could happen, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln was a licensed attorney. But under today's laws, in all 50 states, he couldn't be a licensed attorney. You know what he did to get his license? He read, exactly, he read or studied the law and then what did he do? He took a test. He took a test, he passed the test, and he was licensed. Today he'd have to go to some school somewhere and spend years in, in, uh, in, in a law school where they won't let you, you know, you, you don't necessarily even have time to earn income. For somebody like an Abraham Lincoln, it would be very, very tough, if not impossible, to get a uh, a law license today. So one of the things that I would do is abolish 
the education requirements for all licensing. Okay, if we're going to have licensing, fine. Just make it a test. Just make it a test that you have to pass, and once you pass the test, you're licensed. But I would even be more radical than that, personally. I would change things to what I call private certification, a private certification system. I'd create incentives for private individuals to create their own associations and certify each other under that association's name. That means that you could have multiple nursing associations certifying nurses. And they compete with each other based on quality and how well they, they enforce their requirements. Yeah, exactly. Be more like underwriters laboratory, exactly. And and so that's what I that's what I would move toward. And I would make the legal I would create laws that would make it a fertile ground for that kind of independent groundswell to rise up. Others would let the government certify people. And look, the good thing about certification, if you don't if you use the term correctly, is that when somebody is certified, it doesn't keep other people from performing that profession. It's just that they don't have a little seal of approval. Um, so they have to compete without that advantage of having a seal saying, wow, I did, I did this, that, or the other to get this seal. They would charge less, which is good for us. They would charge less, that's right. You know, I could go and get my hair cut by somebody that has nice clean scissors in their house or something. Um, which is what I'm doing already anyway, only it's my hands. I keep cutting myself. But anyway, um, and then... Uh, and then we could do more, less onerous things like registration and bonding requirements if we're really concerned about liability. We can require bonding. It's not the worst thing in the world to require that. The biggest issue is keeping people out of professions through these ridiculous education requirements that they have for, um, for licensed professions these days. Now, just so you know, a little bit more about the... I, I, I've said my piece on licensing, um, but I want you to know, under, uh, know a little bit more about the 1889 Institute right quick. We do not lobby. Uh, I have a friend who calls, who calls us a white paper shop or something like that. Uh, we do communicate with legislators, but we co communicate with them all, only on issues. We do not... Um, we do not endorse candidates. We do not endorse particular pieces of legislation. If they call me to testify on an issue, and it happens to be a bill that's being heard, I'll talk about the issue, but I don't advocate for or against a bill. Um, so we're kind of in what I like to call the pure 501c3 nonprofit world where we're not lobbyists. So, and we can be found on the Internet, of course, and by the way, if you have any complaints about the website, it's my fault. I did it. There's only three of us, and I'm the only one that's really completely full-time. So that's true. It's dangerous. You could get vertigo looking at those colors. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, but anyway, it's www.1889institute.org. Also, if you're interested... I have a little summary of the paper I write, wrote for the Institute on licensing. So I've got about maybe 20 copies. So if you want one, you can come grab one. And, uh, and all our papers are posted online in case you're interested. It makes good bedtime reading. So. <laughs> thank you very much. Byron, thank you. Stay right there. <laughs> like you. I cut my hair as infrequently as possible, <laughs> and now I know why. I can blame it on licensing. Okay, so now you would think, Byron, that um, you know, cutting programs would be a hard thing to do politically because there's always this, oh, they're going to take this and that away from you, and so there's no political will to cut programs necessarily. But you would think with a bunch of incoming freshmen and it's the beginning of a cycle with no big election next year in the House that doing something about licensing would be an easy sell. 
So I know you said you don't lobby, but have you heard of anybody that might want to file a reform bill? Or do, is there anyone that we should follow up with and see if they're doing anything to reform licensing in our legislature? Well, no. Um, not right offhand. Now, barbers and cosmetologists, their licensing law is up for sunset. As of, I think, the summer of 2017, unless the legislature acts this session to renew the law, the law goes away. And uh, I know someone in Texas who sued over the psychi psychiatric and psychologist law there, and they won. And because of that, right now in Texas, there is effectively no licensing law for psychologists and psychiatrists. Believe it or not, it ought to be a bigger story than it is. But, and there's been no great big danger what I would do is, um, you can keep in touch with me or with anybody else, whoever files a bill to change the sunset date from 2017 to some future date, they need to be pounded on. <laughs> yeah, let us know if that happens, please. What about uh, citizen licensing like marriage, driving, fishing, hunting? Yeah, now... Um, when I, when I talk about licensing, the term is used pretty broadly. And so when I'm talking about occupational licensing, something that gives you the right to practice an occupation as opposed to something that gives you the right to use public resources or to harvest fish or something like that. Now, um, some licensing, let's take, for example, taxi taxis. Um, that's highly restrictive, and it's an occupational license. Even though some of the people who drive taxis aren't themselves citizens. licensed. Well, okay, well, maybe they're not citizens either. <laughs> but <laughs> maybe they're only licensed to drive a car, but... Um, but and, and it's the owner of a company that actually has the license. Um, that's still an occupational license. And taxis are, by the way, a good example of where licensing hurts quality, right? Anybody here used Uber? Holy cow, that was a... I I'd used a taxi a few times in my life, and then I used an Uber, and man, qualitatively, it's a big, big improvement. And you start thinking, why have we been living with this taxi world for so long, right? So... New York City. Well, they have Uber. tried. I, I, you know, the, I don't know what the latest is on that, but I, I, I'm not sure they succeeded in that effort. Probably yes, practically the mafia is enforcing that. Hold on, hold on. Let me come around so you can all comment. Let me get Gus's question here. Okay. Uh, sorry. Earlier you had mentioned that uh, if you're licensed in one state, can't be licensed in another. What do you think of some of the outcomes would be if Oklahoma were to pass a bill that if you were licensed in one state, you could be licensed here? Would there be any negative or positive outcomes of that? Well, it would be positive from my point of view. I definitely think it would be positive. Now, a law like that would be fought tooth and nail by those who are already licensed in this state. But, um, if, 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 for, and look, there are some reciprocation laws already in place, but it has to be, it's always uh, negotiated state to state. So. We may have reciprocal laws with Texas, for example, but not with Kansas. So it would be a great thing if that was passed. Economically and for our welfare, um, there's no reason to restrict other people from coming here to be a physician or something. But, yeah, you would have, be, have a big fight from the physicians. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I heard it costs as much as $250,000 to run a taxi in New York. Uh -huh. Also... I heard that Uber was founded by an ultra-liberal. That's true. And Progressive Insurance is a George Soros company. I don't know about Progressive Insurance. I might have to look into that because I know we have some. Um, I will say this about taxis. I think it was even more than two. In fact, I know it was over a million dollars 
to get a medallion for a taxi in New York at one time. And what was interesting about that was that there was this fellow who was out there bidding for more medallions, and he would bid up the price of medallions, and in doing so, raise the apparent value of the medallions he already owned. Based on that increased equity, he would go get a, a, another loan, because he had a bunch already. He would go and get another loan and bid up the price of medallions again for more medall medallions, which allowed his equity to go up. And he would, in other words, there was a, a medallion bubble in New York. And this guy was the main one who got it. And when U Uber came in, it kicked his rear. Deservedly so. Uh, I enjoyed your question while, or your statement a while ago about electrical. To kind of comment before I make my question to you is that black is hot, white is not, and green is ground. All and, right. And you can never, never trust white. It may not be hot. <laughs> We're going to license you now, Jerome. That's right. Bottom line, my question is, is this licensing, it sounds like to me it's all about to keep the riffraff out. But ostensibly, it sounds like it, it creates a state monopoly in each basically profession. Is that a true statement? That's exactly. That's exactly this correct. I, I, I can't say it any better than that. All right. Uh, David had a question. Where did he go? Okay. Uh, would you hand Porter Davis this microphone? He used to be in the legislature, and I want to hear what he has to say. Get over in the light, Porter. Yeah. It's very interesting way. he mentions licensing cosmetologists because I was in the legislature when that bill came up. And uh, the way they did it, you'd have a good old boy from Little Dixie. We had 29 Republicans in the House at the time, so we couldn't stop anything. But they'd have some Little Dixie Democrat get up and say, folks, this is one for the people. And then they would go on to have all these horrible litanies, and I'll never forget, and this is to justify a two, what has become, I believe, is still a 2,000-hour course with lots of free or slave labor to the beauty colleges, right? But, but they, they were talking about the horrific things that could happen if Granny was getting her permanent, and she had an unskilled person giving her permanent and her hair burned off. <laughs> I fought against it on the floor, but alas, it passed. <laughs> well, I honor you for fighting that. I, that You know, that is, but that's an important point. What they do is they come and they give you these highly speculative horror stories. You see this, geologists, seriously, you see this sinkhole here? Well, somebody, somebody died in that sinkhole. Never would have happened. If we'd had licensed geologists, what? Where, where is the evidence of this? Come on. Uh, they tell the most horrific things, and there's really little evidence that licensing would have made any difference. And you don't know where these stories come from. They never source them. Right. I was reading in the Wall Street Journal where there is a real shortage of uh, airline pilots. And they were citing the fact that they went from 250 hours of airtime to 1,500. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a perfect example. Um, look, I'm, I would leave it to the airlines. I mean, how many of these airlines want somebody behind the stick, the column, or the lever these days since it's all computerized, and uh, who, who's an idiot? I mean... Wouldn't they vet their pilots? These are expensive planes. There's a ton of liability on every single plane. All those people represent dollar signs if you killed them. And uh, you don't want to do it. So why is the government deciding how many hours the pilots need? It's, it's nonsense. It's not needed. Uh, this year we licensed a new profession in Oklahoma. It was one of the ten bills that we used on the Oklahoma Conservative Index, you know, music therapists. <laughs> well, now, if they try to use hard rock, I might be sympathetic to that. Rap. Rap should be outlawed. Or, <laughs> or that Mexican polka music. I really... 
Polka music in general is just wrong. I'm sorry. That's my point of view. But Hey, we're out of time today. Please thank Byron for being our guest today. Now, next Wednesday is the day before the Thanksgiving to God holiday. And we will meet because that's what we do. We meet. We love each other. We fellowship. So raise your hand if you're going to be here. I just want to get an idea. Okay, we'll make sure they have some sort of turkey style uh, Mexican dinner or something. I don't know. But we'll be here. Here's what's on tap. Mr. Ralph Bullard, who was the original headmaster of CHA and is really is, a, is an expert in the history of this nation, is going to speak to us. And he's going to tell us some stories specifically about Squanto and William Bradford. And I got a taste of these stories yesterday in chapel at Christian Heritage Academy. He's such a good storyteller. And he might open some things to you that you hadn't seen before about God's providence in taking care of Bradford and preparing Squanto to prepare the way for the birth of this Christian nation. So you won't want to miss next Wednesday. Uh, we'll see you back here in a week. Thank you all.